the PET scan after two cycles of ABVD type chemotherapy are destined to have a very good outcome. Um, and that's um, shown here. You can see their cure rates are as high as 90 to 95 percent. Um, and if they have a positive PET scan after two cycles of ABVD and continue on with the same treatment, uh, the, the expected outcomes are much less favorable. In these curves, we saw that about only 30 to 35 percent of patients are cured, although we actually see um, that these differences are not quite as dramatic when we look at prospective studies. Um, but based upon this, the prog this finding that an interim PET was, was highly uh, prognostic and even actually was overcame the prognostic significance of a baseline international prognostic score, many studies have evaluated PET-adapted strategies. And in advanced stage disease, there's really two approaches to PET-adapted therapy. The first approach is to start with a moderate regimen like ABVD and then escalate to a stronger regimen if the patients are PET2 positive. Um, and then the second approach is to start with a, a, a stronger regimen like escalate via COP and then de-escalate if the patients are, are PET2 negative. So the first approach was evaluated in the RAFL study, which is really one of the most influential studies uh, that um, for advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma at least until the Echelon 1 study came around. Um, and this study really was practice changing. Uh, the patients enrolled in the study had either stage 3 or stage 4 disease or early unfavorable disease, although the majority of the patients had advanced stage disease who enrolled on the study. And the patients initially started with ABVD chemotherapy, and they received two cycles of treatment, and then they were evaluated by PET. The patients who were PET2 negative, which they defined on the study as having a DOVIL score of 1, 2, or 3, were then randomized to either four cycles of ABVD or actually a less intense therapy with ABD for four cycles. So they dropped the bleomycin. And then the patients who were PET2 positive had their treatment escalated to be a COP-based therapy. Um, th that part of the study was not, um, was not randomized. So looking specifically at the patients who were PET2 negative, um, actually, as we would expect, and you know, it's nice to see that the majority of the patients are PET2 negative. It was 84% of the patients on the study. And when you look at their outcomes comparing ABVD versus AVD, it's really identical. So indicating that we're not losing any efficacy if we drop the bleomycin for patients who are PET2 negative. Um, and importantly, we're actually improving the tolerability of the treatment. Um, when you compare the toxicity of the two arms, there were higher rates of neutropenic fever as well as um, respiratory side effects and other, um, other adverse events. And so based upon this study, uh, it, as we, were, we changed our practice. And um, for patients who are receiving six cycles of ABVD, it's now standard of care to drop the bleomycin if the patients are PET2 negative based upon having a DOVIL score of three or better. Um, with regard to the patients who were PET2 positive on this study, uh, their outcomes were better than what we would have expected comparing to, you know, compared to those historical series. Uh, so the three-year progression-free survival here is 67.5%, and so indicating that in, increasing the intensity of the treatment with a regimen like escalated PIACOP may improve the outcomes for these patients, although, as I said, this part of the study was not randomized, so we don't know um, how much this improved their outcomes compared to whether they, uh, if, if they had stayed on the same therapy. Uh, as I mentioned, there's the other approach to pet adaptive therapy, and that's starting with a much stronger regimen and then de-escalating, and that was evaluated in the LISA study in which patients with advanced stage disease were initially randomized to a standard arm where they were intended to receive six cycles of escalated BACOP or an experimental arm where they received pet adapted therapy. And on the experimental arm, they started off with two cycles of escalated BACOP, but if they were PET2 negative, they de-escalated to four cycles of ABVD. If they were PET2 positive, they stayed with the escalated BACOP. And the primary endpoint of the study was to compare these two approaches, um, so either a pet adapted approach or a standard arm where patients just received six cycles of escalated BACOP, and they found there was no difference with regard to progression-free survival and overall survival, so indicating that you can safely de-escalate patients who are uh, starting off with escalated via COP. Um, the, this has not been a, uh, an approach that we have really adapted, um, primarily because um, we 
prefer not to use Escalabia cup given the high toxicity, both immediate toxicity with regard to hematologic toxicity, but also long-term toxicity with concerns for infertility and secondary malignancies. And so even though this um, shows a, this was a very promising approach, um, for we tend to use um, ABVD as our backbone for initiation of treatment rather than starting with Escalabia cup. Um, and now, as I already alluded to in the beginning, we now have three new drugs, uh, three new novel drugs that have really dramatically in, influenced or changed the landscape for Hodgkin lymphoma. And I'm showing you here the waterfall plots for each of these drugs from the studies that evaluated these drugs in the relapse and refractory setting. So the first one is brentuxin amphidotin, which is the anti-CD30 antibody drug conjugate which in the relapse and refractory setting showed an re overall response rate of 76% and a complete response rate of 36%. And then nivolumab and pembrolizumab, the anti-PD-1 agents, which are also highly active in relapse and refractory disease, um, with 66 to 72% of patients responding and about 20% of the patients having complete response uh, to single agent. So given the high efficacy of these drugs, as well as the fairly good tolerability, there was, of course, there has been and continues to be a, a significant interest in evaluating these drugs earlier on in the treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma. So the, the biggest study, uh, the most influential study now for advanced stage disease is the Echelon 1 study. Um, and this was a study that evaluated brentuximab plus ABD um, compared to ABVD. So this was specifically for patients with stage 3 or stage 4 disease, um, and they were randomized to six cycles of brentuximab plus ABD versus six cycles of ABVD. The study enrolled over 1,300 patients. Uh, the primary endpoint was an, to observe an improvement in two-year modified progression-free survival. And when the study was initially presented or, or you know, reported in 2018, um, it did show an improvement in modified progression-free survival, um, the over, there was no initially no overall survival benefit, and um, initially the results of the study were, um, even though the, this regimen became FDA approved based upon the initial results of the study, there wasn't as much enthusiasm initially of adopting BVABD for advanced patients with advanced stage disease, and that was primarily because of increased toxicity associated with the regimen, such as peripheral neuropathy and uh, the need for growth factors such as neutropenic and require because of higher risk of neutropenic fever um, and um, and really because the difference was quite was was fairly small between the two regimens but now we have longer follow-up um, and most recently this past year we we are seeing six-year follow-up um, from from this study and with with longer follow-up we continue to see an improvement in progression-free survival for the brintuximab plus AVD arm with their six-year progression-free survival of 82% compared to 74%. And this benefit is really seen across almost every group, which I also think is um, impressive, um, including patients with both state, either stage three or stage four disease, um, also with patients with all the different um, risk groups with regard to the international prognostic score. Um, the one group that doesn't seem to benefit so much from this combination are the patients who are over 60, and that might be because uh, the combination of brentuximab plus ABD may be a little too toxic for that group. And I do have a different approach for those patients. I tend to use sequential therapy with brentuximab followed by ABD uh, as per uh, the study that was published by Andy Evans. Um, so even more impressive was that this sustained improvement in progression-free survival has actually translated into improvement in overall survival. And that was reported um, initially in February and presented uh, by Steve Ansel at ASCO and now published in the New England Journal. Um, and it, it's really quite impressive that the study has now shown an overall survival benefit for these patients. Um, and that has led to this regimen becoming the preferred regimen for patients with stage three or stage four disease and has changed my practice. Um, so, the six-year overall survival is 94% for the brentuximab arm and 89% uh, for the patients receiving ABVD. Uh, with the waterfall, uh, I mean, with the forest plot, uh, with regard to the overall survival comparison, many of the groups um, show an overall survival benefit as well. 
um, we wouldn't expect this to be as dramatic as we see with the progression-free survival forest plot, given that the difference is, is quite small, but it's, you know, we, we do see quite a difference, quite an improvement in most of the groups. Um, so as I, I already mentioned, one of the downsides of brentuximab plus AVD is the uh, potential for toxicity. Uh, this regimen is associated with a higher rate of febrile neutropenia, and it was uh, determined or, you know, realized early on that there's really a requirement to use growth factor uh, with this regimen, whereas we don't tend to use it at all with ABVD, um, except for maybe for older patients or patients who are, um, have a history, you know, develop neutropenic fever, which is really quite rare with ABVD. Um, so that really adds to the side effect profile, you know, given that growth factors on their own have some side effects, but also the cost of the regimen. Um, there's also a significant rate of peripheral neuropathy with two-thirds of the patients developing this with brintuximab plus ABD. The grades are certainly much higher um, compared to ABVD. And even when you look five years down the road, about 20% of the patients continue to have some symptoms related to their peripheral neuropathy, although they do have significant improvement over time. Um, a positive side of brintuximab plus ABD is that it doesn't include bleomycin, so we certainly see a much lower rate of bleomycin toxicity. Um, so getting back to my case, so this, this was a 35-year-old woman with stage 4 Hodgkin lymphoma and international prognostic score of 3. Um, I treated her quite a while ago, and I treated her as per the RAFL study, and thankfully she has done, she's done quite well. I, I gave her two cycles of ABVD. She had a negative PET scan after two cycles and was able to de-escalate to AVD um, and has remained in remission over five years out from treatment. Um, in, two, in, in this year, I'm sorry, there's, there's a little bit of background noise all of a sudden. I don't know if everyone hears that. Um, okay, better. <laughs> um, so um, as I've now kind of already been alluding to, my preference has really changed. And if I had met this patient uh, this year, um, my preference would be to, to treat her with brentuximab plus ABD. Um, and um, that has been my, that's been my practice um, recently. So um, Certainly, this has been, brentuximab plus ABD has been associated with some nice progress or improvement in outcomes for patients with advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, there's still certainly some room for improvement. Um, I'm showing you here the curves uh, showing the outcomes with regard to the interim PET. Um, so patients who are PET2 negative receiving, uh, who, who initially started with BVABD, um, their five-year progression-free survival is 85%. So it's certainly good, but there's still 15% of patients who are failing therapy and needing second-line therapy. Um, and likewise, even the patients who are PET2 positive, um, who initially start with BVABD, their outcomes are better than what we saw with the historical series, as their five-year progression-free survival is 61%. Um, and that, because, of, because it's actually better, we actually tend to continue on with their therapy and not change their therapy if they're PET2 positive. Um, but on the other hand, there's certainly significant room for improvement. Um, so. Of course, there's a lot of interest in evaluating checkpoint inhibitors potentially in the frontline setting, and there's some nice evidence that suggests that this may be um, important or, or useful for at least a select group of patients. Um, so this was there was an analysis done of patients who were enrolled on various different studies evaluating the Stanford Five regimens, which was standard combination chemotherapy followed by radiation therapy, um, and so these patients. Um, these studies included studies for patients with early stage disease as well as advanced stage disease. And when you look at the outcomes with regard to their stage, um, as you would expect, the patients who with advanced stage disease who are seen on the gray curve, um, they have a less favorable outcome compared to the patients with early stage favorable or unfavorable disease who are seen on the blue or the yellow curve. And um, for the majority of the patients who were in these studies, there was baseline tissue av available to evaluate for the nine, for 9P24 amplification, uh, the 9P24 chromosome amplification. Um, and this was looked at because this part of the chromosome contains the gene for PDL1 as well as JAK2. Um, and so um, it's responsible for upregulation of PDL1 on the surface of Reed Sternberg cells. Um, and so potentially 
responsible for the high response rate that we see in Hodgkin lymphoma um, with these with, with anti-PD-1 agents. And what they found was that when you look at their outcomes with regard to whether or not they have uh, 9P24.1 amplification, the patients who had ampl amplification who were seen on the dark pink curve had a much less favorable outcome um, compared to the patients who um, had less amplification or just copy, um, copy gain or polysomy. And what was also interesting is that when you look at the whole group as a whole, about a third of the patients had amplification, but when you look at them with regard to early stage or advanced stage disease, it was really the advanced stage disease patients that were enriched for having 9P24.1 amplification, suggesting that this is a group that may, more, more, may be more likely to benefit from incorporation of a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, and we also saw in the study evaluating nivolumab in the relapsed and refractory setting that 9P24.1 amplification, as well as overexpression, increased expression of PDL1 was uh, associated with improvement in progression-free survival. So once again, um, maybe these are, maybe using this as a marker could identify the patients who are more likely to benefit from frontline incorporation of anti-PD-1 blockade. Um, so nivolumab has already been looked at in the frontline setting, at least the safety of incorporating this in the frontline setting has been established. And that was established in the Checkmate 205 study um, which was a study that involved patients with early unfavorable disease as well as patients with stage 3 and stage 4 disease. Patients initially received four doses of single-agent nivolumab, and then they received the combination of nivolumab plus AVD for, for six cycles. Um, and um, this study, once I, as I mentioned, established the safety of this combination. Uh, the outcomes looked quite favorable, although there were only 51 patients on the study. Uh, the progression-free survival at nine months was 92%. Uh, and this has led to evaluating this regimen in a much larger group of patients. And so this is a North American cooperative group study that is ongoing and actually almost completely enrolled um, in which patients with stage three or stage four disease are um, randomized to either nivolumab plus AVD or brintuximab plus AVD for six cycles. Um, my understanding is that there, there may be just 100 more patients that need to be enrolled. Overall, the study is going to be almost 1,000 patients. Um, and we'll learn from the study whether one of these regimens is superior to the other, but also what we'll learn is how, hopefully how we'll, what we'll learn is how to select patients for each one of these regimens, um, as there are many correlative studies that are planned with this study, including evaluation of circulating tumor DNA, metabolic tumor volume, 9P24.1 amplification, uh, PDL1 expression, um, and um, as well as cytokines such as TARC. Um, so hopefully um, we'll, these will help us figure out how to best select patients for the most appropriate therapy. So shifting gears to the relapse and refractory setting, um, traditionally what we have said for patients who have failed their frontline therapy for Hodgkin lymphoma, we traditionally said that about 50% of those patients can be cured. And that was based upon study, the two randomized studies that established autologous stem cell transplant as the standard of care for patients who with relapse and refractory disease. And so the standard of care is to, is to administer some kind of second line therapy and then for responding patients to then consolidate with an autologous stem cell transplant. And in these older studies, about 50% of those patients were cured. More modern studies or more recent studies show a much higher uh, cure rate or much better progression-free survival. And I'm showing you uh, curves from combination of data from two pet-adapted studies that we performed at Sloan Kettering, one with ICE and GBD and one with brentuximab and ICE, showing a five-year progression-free survival of 78%. Uh, likewise, uh, the more recent study with brentuximab plus no nivolumab given a second line followed by consolidation with transplant, the three-year progression-free survival on the study was 77%. So suggesting that now we can expect that patients who fail their second-line therapy for Hodgkin lymphoma, we probably can cure about three-quarters of these patients um, with, with our more uh, modern approaches. So what accounts for this improvement in our outcomes? Um, well, one of, these, one, one of the important factors has been the focus on pre-transplant PET. Um, and so multiple studies have shown that 
one of the most important prognostic factors for a patient proceeding to transplant is whether or not they can get their PET scan negative. And that was very nicely shown on a PET-adapted study that was led by Craig Moskowitz at Memorial, um, back in, uh, published back in 2012, in which patients who had initially uh, failed their frontline therapy received ice-based chemotherapy and then were evaluated by PET. Those who were PET negative went on to transplant, whereas those who were PET positive received non-cross-resistant chemotherapy, which I'm cytobine, venerobine, and liposomal doxorubicin, and then were considered for transplant. Uh, and what, they, what he found was that out of about 100 patients who were enrolled in the study, about 60 of those patients were able to achieve, uh, uh, have a negative PET scan after just ice-based chemotherapy. Um, and those patients are seen on the blur, blue curve, and as expected, they did quite well. The other patients, uh, the other 40 patients, about half of those patients were able, to, were able to become PET negative with GVD-based chem chemotherapy, and those patients are seen on the green curve. And then, as expected, the patients who remained PET positive on the, blue, on the red curve um, did, um, did not do well. Um, but what this showed was that uh, achieving a negative PET scan is associated with, a, with an excellent outcome, and it didn't actually matter whether it took one or two steps to get to the negative PET scan, as long as the patients were negative before transplant, PET negative before transplant, they were uh, destined to have a, a, a favorable outcome. And so based upon that, the primary outcome for many, for all of the studies evaluating second-line regimens in Hodgkin lymphoma has been to, has been the rate of PET negativity. And I'm showing you here a summary of some of the recent regimens that have been evaluated in the second-line setting. And as you can see, overall, the, the PET negative rate is um, is quite favorable. Um, so these include PET-adapted sequential regimens, either with the ICE and GVD, which I just showed you. Um, also, there's brentuximab followed by chemotherapy. Um, and, and these regimens are associated with 67 to 77% 70, of patients achieving a PET-negative response before transplant. More recently, brentuximab and benamustine has been evaluated in second-line regimens. Um, and again, these complete response rates are quite high, often ranging in the 70% range. And then uh, now we're also looking at PD-1 blockade in the second line regimen, in the second line setting, and this and the regimens that are most further furthest along are brentuximab plus nivolumab, as well as pembrolizumab plus GVD, where complete response rates range from 67 to 95%. Um, so just to show you a little bit more about pembrolizumab plus GVD is this has become my second line regimen of choice um, based upon the high complete response rate that we was, that we observed. Um, this was a phase two study for patients who had failed their frontline therapy for Hodgkin lymphoma. The primary endpoint was complete response by PET. And patients received up to four cycles of treatment. Uh, the cycles included pembrolizumab given on day one of a 21-day cycle, and then gemcitabine, venerobine, and liposomal doxorubicin given on days one and day eight. Uh, patients were evaluated by PET after two and four cycles, and if they had a complete response after two cycles, they could go right to transplant. Otherwise, they would receive four cycles of treatment and then be considered for transplant. Uh, and so this is just a summary of the results that we observed. There were 38 evaluable patients. This includes 41% of patients with primary refractory disease. Every patient responded to the treatment, and actually over 90% of the patients had a complete response. And most of those responses, most of those complete responses after, happened after only two cycles of treatment. Um, virtually all patients proceeded to transplant. The two patients who did not proceed to transplant was really um, based upon their own preference. Um, and so we now see that um, actually we now have a median of two years follow-up for these patients, and actually only one patient has relapsed. So not only has this complete response rate, you know, not only have we seen such a nice high complete response rate, this seems to have translated into a very durable response. And I initially thought that maybe this was because of an interaction between PD-1 blockade and gemcitabine, but we actually also see very nice responses with PD-1 blockade combined with other chemotherapy regimens. Um, I'm showing you here the schema from a study evaluating pembrolizumab plus ICE, um, in which patients received up to three cycles of pembrolizumab plus ICE, followed by autologous central transplant. 
They also saw a very high complete response rate, as high as 86%. So similar to what we observed, um, and uh, the durability looks quite favorable, um, with 88% of the patients progression-free, um, with, with uh, limited follow-up at this point. Um, so there seems to be this suggestion that maybe incorporating uh, the PD-1 blocking agents may be associated with not only a higher response rate, but also more durable responses. Um, but this, and this is going to be formally tested in a randomized study. This is a study that hasn't yet opened, um, but will be opening within the North American uh, cooperative groups. And um, this is evaluating patients receiving second-line therapy with either ICE or GVD, uh, plus or minus pembrolizumab, followed by consolidation with transplant. So we'll be able to formally determine whether the incorporation of PD-1 blockade truly makes a difference in the setting. Of course, my bias is that I think it does, but um, you know, it would be very interesting to see um, that whether this study confirms our suspicions. Um, and so, and then quickly, I just want to briefly touch upon uh, some emerging therapies uh, beyond transplant in the second, in the um, beyond the second line setting. Um, so there is some somewhat promising data with regard to CAR T cell. Um, it's not as exciting as I would have hoped, um, but uh, the preliminary data uh, with CD30 CAR T was published in JCO in 2020. This included this series included 41 patients who were treated at two different institutions on really on two different studies, and they pulled the data. And they observed an overall response rate of 72 percent with a complete response rate of 59 percent. But a little disappointingly, uh, at one year, only about a third of the patients remained in remission. Um, the group at uh, University of North Carolina are looking at um, a kind of improved CAR product in that targets CD30, but also expresses CCR4, and that potentially allows the CARs to be attracted to the Reed-Sternberg cells. Um, and they presented this data at ASH, this past ASH, and that included 11 evaluable patients. The overall response rate was 100%. Complete response rate looked maybe a little better at 72 percent, um, and you know, with limited follow-up, the median progression-free survival had not yet been reached. So maybe showing a, a little bit more um, higher efficacy, but just in a very small group of patients so far. Uh, and then the other promising treatments are really just uh, building upon anti-PD-1 therapy, um, which with um, adding drugs that hopefully or potentially enhance the activity of uh, pembrolizumab or nivolumab or other anti-PD-1 agents. Um, so examples of these include pembrolizumab plus ruxolitinib and then pembrolizumab plus HDAC inhibitors such as varinostat and atinostat. Um, and the response rates look fairly promising. Um, many of these studies include patients who had already progressed on pembrolizumab. Um, and so it appears that potentially adding these additional agents may enhance the activity. It's hard to say if any of these approaches look more favorable than others, um, since they're all small studies. But um, at this point, I think you know we'll look for um, more data in this area and longer follow-up and, and more patients enrolled. And, and hopefully, through correlative studies, we'll be able to learn whether certain adding certain agents to anti-PD-1 blockade really enhances their activity and allows patients who already progressed on anti-PD-1 therapy to um, achieve a response again. So uh, in 2022, uh, the main change, as I mentioned, was the um, really uh, a widespread acceptance of brentuximab plus AVD for advanced stage disease. Um, as I mentioned, I was initially skeptical about incorporating it, but now given the fact that the improve, the sustained improvement in progression-free survival translated into an overall survival benefit, I really have now started using it as my preferred regimen. Um, and there's also increasing use of anti-PD-1 agents, um, anti-PD-1 plus chemo combinations for second line. Um, I mentioned that there is a randomized study that's going to confirm whether this is truly the most the best approach, but I've already adopted the use of pembrolizumab plus GVD as my second line regimen of choice. Um, and, um, you know, based upon the data that, um, that we saw at our institution, and um, so I'm, I'm very comfortable with that approach at this time. Um, looking ahead, I think that uh, we'll see if anti-PD-1 blockade ends up being integrated into the frontline setting. 
Um, we have that large cooperative group at the study that um, will be resulting soon. Um, and uh, we'll also determine whether we should be using these drugs in the second line setting or whether or not, um, you know, whether we're truly making a difference there. Um, and then finally, um, I think we see some exciting emerging roles for for, mod for CAR T and anti PD one combinations. Um, and hopefully, um, I think, you know, if we see some promising combinations, um, maybe they would even move earlier on into the treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma. So thank you so much for your attention, and um, I'm happy to, um, I'm, I'm, I look forward to all of your questions. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was very crystal clear, excellent, and fabulous. Your presentation was superb. Now we have some Indian colleagues. Thank you. Now we have some Indian colleagues who are going to ask you some questions. So we, have, we are going to bother you a little bit. So we'll start from uh, the discussions we have. Uh, Dr. Shekhar Patil, your, your question first. Uh, yes, sir. I uh, it was a very wonderful talk, uh, and uh, uh, I have got a question. Basically, uh, uh, we have got a patients in last two years, uh, stage three, stage four disease, by which ABVD PET negative by two cycles. We have completed six cycle. Within one year, they relapsed. Are there any methods by which we can identify any subgroup of patients where we can say that? Oh, this patient has got high chance of relapse. Is there any method by which I want to ask uh, uh, Madam? Um, I, I love that question because I, I, I wish we don't have a way of determining who is going to relapse so quickly or who's going to fail their therapy. But I, I think that there are, there are some methods that I think may we may learn can help us. And one of those is uh, I, there's really two methods that are kind of in development and one is baseline metabolic tumor volume which is really just a measure using the PET scan to measure the overall uh, tumor burden uh, the FDG avid tumor burden um, and that has been found to be uh, prognostic in in both early stage patients and advanced stage patients and I think that there's a suggestion at least you know we have some data from one of our studies that it seems to maybe pr predict for patients who have or are going to be resistant to uh, you know at least standard therapy that's completely um, um, you know we need more data to, to confirm that but I think that's one of the methods that we may use in the future um, it's it's you know as we um, you know to select patients that might need something different or may need a change earlier on um, the other method is by um, is baseline circulating tumor DNA um, so Circulating tumor DNA is can be detected in patients who have um, Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, it actually, they, it, apparently, the tumors produce quite a lot of circulating tumor DNA, um, and that is something that's being um, evaluated by many groups, looking at you know are there certain uh, mutations that predict for treatment failure, um, and and so that's something that I think in the future we'll potentially use to help guide therapy, and and that's. And I, I'm hoping that that large cooperative group comparing ABVD to BVABD, um, you know, that by using some of these methods um, or by by testing some of these methods in that study, um, that will be a way to, to help identify those patients who are more likely to fail therapy and, and need something different. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Doctor, that's all your question, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, uh, if you can uh, elaborate a little bit about the initial risk classification, um, especially in the early stages where it depends on tests like ESR. So, find that these tests are not very reliable. Um, and we are basing a lot of important decisions on initial classification. Um, so how uh, do you use that in your practice? Uh, um, so, so thank you for that question. So um, with regard to early stage disease, which I really didn't touch upon at all in this talk, um, yeah, as you mentioned, there's the, the risk factors that we use to, I, 
to distinguish patients who have favorable versus unfavorable diseases really hist are really historic and um, were developed at the time when um, patients were only receiving radiation therapy, really, you know, and they were never really validated in our um, current treatments. But because the factors were used um, to uh, for eligibility for the various studies, you know, that's something it's still used today. Um, and so, you know, elevated SED rate and um, uh, and um, having extra nodal sites of disease or, or having more than two or three nodal sites of disease are these, you know, factors that have been found to be um, prognostic. I guess the one thing, the one, the one of those that really changes my management is whether or not a patient has bulky disease. Um, and that's one of those risk factors as well. And that is something that I use to really, that really changes how I treat patients. Um, if you take out the patients with bulky disease, all the other patients with early stage disease, um, the way I use those risk factors um, is that if they have none of the risk factors at all, um, I, I um, sometimes, you know, I, I, I sometimes will treat them with a, um, a a lower intensity approach. So, for example, if my plan is to give combined modality therapy with with ABVD and radiation, and they have none of the risk factors, then I do think it's reasonable, and they, they, you know, I think that they would have a very good outcome with just two cycles of ABVD and 20 gray of radiation. Um, alternatively, if they have any one of those risk factors, then four cycles of ABVD and 30 gray of radiation is um, would be my standard. Um, more and more, I, I use. I, I don't use that much radiation therapy, particularly for the younger patients. I'm worried about the long-term toxicity, um, you know, the risk of not only secondary malignancies but also cardiovascular disease. So I, I, um, I, I don't use that much. Right? So I often am avoiding the radiation therapy, and, and instead I'm using pet-adapted approaches. And so my most common regimen that I use for someone who has early-stage disease um, is a study that was evaluated by the CLGB study, a CLGB group in the U.S. Um, which was a study in which patients with either early favorable or unfavorable, as long as they didn't have bulk, um, were enrolled, and they received two cycles of ABVD, and if they were PET2 negative, which was defined by Doval's score of 1, 2, or 3, they received another two cycles of ABVD and then no further therapy, so just basically four cycles of ABVD, um, and, and um, as long as they were PET2 negative. And I use that regimen regardless of their SED rate or... Um, you know, B symptoms. I don't. I don't use any of those factors to determine um, whether or not um, how whether or not I'm going to use that regimen. Um, and and I so I'm comfortable with that. Um, and then for patients, um, so so I, I guess that's kind of answers your question. Is that I'm not using them as yeah. much because we we know that those patients were all enrolled. You know, favorable and unfavorable were enrolled in those studies. Um, for the bulky patients, um, there was recently a study um, that was. Uh, led by the Alliance Group uh, in the U.S. that um, showed that we can get away with just six cycles of ABVD, and as long as they have a negative PET scan after two cycles, as well as after six cycles, um, we can also we can avoid radiation therapy for those patients, which in the past traditionally had been something we incorporated because they had bulky disease. So um, for bulky patients, I basically will treat them as per the Rathel study with with six cycles of ABVD. Great. Uh, thank you. I think that's a very uh, clear explanation and it is very comforting to know that we could use this simplified way of uh, you know, making decisions uh, rather than uh, worry about ESR and few other things which are sometimes difficult to be sure. Uh, and in the same line, um, so... Uh, you mentioned that uh, even in bulky disease, you would avoid radiation if it is PET2 negative and PET6 negative. Uh, even if there is residual disease of, say, 6-7 centimeters? Yes. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I think that's it's pretty common for there to be residual tissue. Um, and but I, you know, as long if the if the PET scan is negative, I I would just monitor them. I wouldn't use the radiation therapy. We had a patient about uh, almost ten centimeter residual uh, PET two negative, PET six negative, but we still gave radiation. And even after two three years, uh, it is still about same. Uh, 
um, so we could have avoided radiation in that patient even with a larger size i i think it's i i mean based upon the data from as actually two different studies kind of support that we could avoid radiation one is from the alliance study which was not a randomized study but their um, the three year uh, event-free th survival, uh, or I don't remember if it was event-free or progression-free, it was about 93%. So um, using that approach, you know, you can see very nice outcomes. Of course, there's going to be some patients who um, who don't, uh, you know, who end up relapsing, um, but the majority of the patients will do well. Um, there was also a study led by uh, Dr. Gallimini um, in which patients, um, that enrolled both advanced-stage patients as well as early-stage patients, but there was um, they looked specifically at analysis of the patients who had early stage bulky disease on their study, and this was again a very similar approach. They received six cycles of ABVD, and if they initially had a larger mass at the beginning, which it was a range, you know, they looked at all patients who had a list initially a five centimeter or more initial mass, um, so you know, on the bulkier side, but included patients who truly had bulky disease. They were then randomized at the end of the study to either no radiation or, or radiation, and there was no difference in that in those two groups either. So we have kind of now two studies: one that's actually randomized to indicate that we can avoid radiation therapy for those patients. Great. And uh, would you switch to BCOP uh, for PET positive, or would you what else for PET positive? Yeah, so I, I don't, I, as I mentioned, I, I don't love be a cop. Um, it's, um, I, I haven't used it very, I honestly use it very infrequently. I, you know, I've only used it a few times. So I, I often don't switch actually. Um, and so what I would do, it depends upon how, how, you know, those, how, how the PET scan really looks. So many patients will have, um, at, when you do their PET scan after two cycles, it, will, it may be dramatically better, but they're just minimal residual disease. And so what I would do in those situations, I actually do continue on with ABVD, and I, I check another PET scan after two cycles. Um, I just won't drop the bleomycin. Um, and then if there's still persistent disease after four cycles, I'll do a biopsy and confirm whether or not they have persist, you know, truly persistent disease and then take them down a second line course, you know, with, with autologous or transplant. Um, so it's, it's rare that I'll escalate to escalate via cop. Um, if they truly have, um, if after two cycles, you know, their, um, their PET2 shows, you know, you know, clearly residual disease, then I think it's, a, it's, it's reasonable to consider in the, in those situations. But the majority of the patients are really kind of on the borderline where they just have mildly active disease. And so I rather give them the benefit of the doubt and give them a little, a uh, few more cycles before checking again. It, I think, yeah, I mean, because uh, these are a lot of things where we waver and uh, escalated because becomes quite difficult, uh, more so in our setting. And there is, I yeah. think, no survival advantage with that also. So that one more a reason to think. But when we see NCCN guideline and, you know, kind of try to follow that strictly uh, in a curative setting, these dilemmas arise. Uh, a last question, uh, if it's okay, Amit. Yeah, can we come back to you again, sir? Yes. Yeah, sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Intizar Mehdi, your question, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you very much for an excellent lecture on this topic. So, madam, I'm a pediatric hematologist, oncologist, and I treat children and young adults, maybe until 18 or 19 years of age. So, usually I follow the Euronet uh, PHL protocol where we use OIPA and uh, COPTAC or COP-based uh, you know, chemo. And we have had good survival for most of the patients like not lymphoma with this treatment. However, the patients who relapse, we use the eye salvage uh, chemotherapy followed by auto HSCT. And some patients will end up getting radiation based on the criteria already adopted to find but my question is, do we still continue to use high salvage uh, chemotherapy in pediatric hospital lymphoma at the time of first relapse? Or is it time that we consider uh, Breltixumab or Neolumab-based uh, chemotherapy even at the time of first relapse? We until recently used to consider Bren and Nevo for patients who relapse post, uh, you know, first salvage chemo and auto HSCT because of various reasons, availability, cost, and so many other factors. But uh, is it time that we should start considering Bren and Nevo 
at the time of first relapse for pediatric corticoid glaucoma relapse patients? Um, yeah, so I, I did, your question, didn't, your, the sound's not as, was not as good, but I, I think your, your main question was whether or not we should use, still be using ICE as our second line therapy or should we be using some of these newer regimens? Um, did I get the gist of the question? Yes, yes, that, that's what it is, yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, it is, I am no longer using ICE as, I mean, you know, I personally, <laughs> and, and many other people, I think, are, are no longer using ICE as our, as the, as the first salvage or as the second line therapy, um, because, um, you know, before, I guess before uh, we did the study with Pembro plus GBD, um, my treatment of choice uh, as second line was to use the combination of brintuximab plus nivolumab. Um, and that was partly because it was so well, so it, it tends to be fairly easy to give. You know, there, it, it tends to be fairly well tolerated. It's nice that we can give a regimen as an outpatient. Um, the efficacy was, was quite nice. Um, and, you know, and I think in the studies have shown that the durability from that is, it looks very favorable. So um, I have started to use, I had originally started using that. And then for patients who receive that regimen, um, and then if they still have residual activity on their pet, um, usually, typically then that would be a situation where I might consider ice, um, you know, as a second salvage. And, um, you know, with the idea that we don't, you know, I, I still believe that achieving a negative PET scan before transplant is, is very important. And so, um, you know, I, if we can get, try to get them closer to being PET negative after that second salvage, I think um, they have the best chance of being cured. Um, and so, um, that's what I had previously been been doing, and now um, and now I think a, a lot of people have started to ad adapt using pembrolizumab plus plus GVD because it was added to the NCCM guidelines, so it's an it's now an option that that at least we can use in the U.S. I don't know if it's I'm sure it would not be straightforward, or I don't know if it's straightforward for you guys to to be able to get it, but um, you know we we are able to to get it based upon the NCCM guidelines, and so I'm using that. Um, where I, I give two cycles, most of the patients thankfully go into remission, and then I and then I take them to transplant. If they don't go into remission, that's when I start to bring in the older standard regimens. Um, if they never receive brintuximab, then I might use a brintuximab-based regimen. Um, otherwise, you know, and, and and actually, there's nice data with brintuximab plus ice, and so that might be something I would use if they've already received brintuximab. That's when I would use ice. Thank you so okay, much. Thank you. That answers, uh, and uh, one more question is: uh, sure, sure, uh, when do you sure. place allogenic uh, bone marrow transplant in uh, refractory glass pots in lymphoma in pediatric lymphoma? Allo transplant. Oh, when would I use allo transplant? So yeah. it's I almost it's we're using allo transplant just so infrequently now, um, and that's because you know patients can have such long. Um, remissions or, or at least disease control on checkpoint inhibitors, you know, if they've um, had relapse after an auto transplant. So it is really um, less frequent that we're using it. Um, the patients that I am considering it for um, are really, you know, just such rare patients now, but they're patients who um, have progressed on on PD-1 blockade and as well as brintuximab, you know, just can't tolerate or, or can't, are no longer eligible for those regimens due to maybe some significant toxicity that they um, experience. Um, and, and so, and maybe already even received CAR T cell on, on one of the, ther on one of the studies. Um, and so for those patients, I aim to try to get them into remission. And often, you know, at, because it, if they've recently had a checkpoint inhibitor, they tend to be a little bit more sensitive to chemotherapy in that setting. So we can hopefully get them into remission for with some kind of combination chemotherapy and, and consolidate with allo transplant. Um, but it, it is less and less that I'm that I'm using it. Okay, got it, ma'am. Thank you. So it is used less often, and we would consider it only at the time of second third relapse, especially if we have exhausted most of the other available options. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Dr. Abhilasha, you just keep your question ready. In the meanwhile, I will take some questions from the chat box. Dr. Karan has a question I think has been answered. In your practice, how do you manage patients with advanced Hodgkin's who have interim PET positive? And another question he has said, when do you consider LOBMT in relapse cases? Um, so 
Now, now that we're using brentuximab plus AVD, um, the patients who are PET2 positive are typically, for the, the, on the study, the patients just continued on with brentuximab plus AVD, um, you know, and their progression-free survival was 60%. So it's, it's not awful. So we often are continuing on, um, you know, I, my preference if they're PET2 positive is that I'd want to get another PET after four cycles, make sure they're not progressing and, um, you know, and, and if, if the PET scan, certainly if they're st still positive, I would do a biopsy um, to determine whether or not they need to um, get salvage therapy. Thank you so much. Dr. Abhilasha, your question, please. Uh, thank you, madam, for that excellent talk. So uh, my question is about very late relapses in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, so a recent study on a, a very large German cohort of almost 1,100 patients published in blood cancer in uh, 2022 has attributed mixed cellularity subtype and a single modality of therapy that is chemo without radiation as a risk factor for late relapse. Now in a developing country like ours, uh, mixed cellularity subtype constitutes the bulk unlike the developed countries. So uh, whether these two factors should impact our front frontline treatment? Um, so, that's, so that's interesting. I, I think that, um... Yeah, I guess I, I feel like I'm, I'm somewhat spoiled in, in the treatments that, I, that, that we can get in the second line setting and beyond. And, um, and you know, knowing that, um, that we have um, regimens in the second line setting that probably overcome some of those um, negative prognostic factors, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I tend to be, you know, comfortable with, you know, kind of like, you know, trying a milder approach, like a, a, a combination chemotherapy without radiation. Um, if, if the, um, if, if there's, you know, if, if the response rate or, you know, or access to transplant in the second line setting or um, access to some of these novel agents in the second line setting is really a concern, um, and, you know, given the potentially higher risk for these patients, then I think that, giving com combination chemotherapy or combined modality therapy with chemotherapy and radiation certainly is associated with the highest chance of cure with the frontline treatment and allows, um, you know, a higher number of patients to avoid needing any additional therapy. And so um, I think it's, um, you know, it's certainly um, reasonable to consider using those, uh, that common, you know, radiation early on um, to increase your chance of cure so that you can avoid um, having to get uh, treatment, you know, multiple treatments down the road. Thank you. Dr. Rajini Priya, your question, please. Dr. Rajini. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, thank you, Alison, ma'am. So that was a wonderful talk on advanced transplant lymphoma. So my question for you is like, what are the infertility rates you see with the use of ABVD regimen in advanced uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma patients? And do you routinely advise for sperm cryopreservation in all your patients? So this is especially important because like uh, some patients who tend to be PET positive, uh, PET2 positive, or who have either a refractory disease or early relapses, where we don't have time for the sperm recovery and advise them for sperm cryopreservation at later point of time. So do we need to get it uh, uh, at early, uh, like, as soon as the diagnosis is done of Hodgkin's lymphoma, or like how do you manage, like uh, how do you advise your patients regarding sperm cryopreservation and NLP? Um, I really advocate for fertility preservation at the time of initial diagnosis. Um, and um, there's a little bit of background noise. Uh, there you go. Um, so um, I, you know, I think that's a great question because um, we know that. ABVD and even BVABD, the fertility uh, data with both those regimens shows that um, um, they're, you know, they have a low risk of causing um, infertility. Um, and so that's reassuring, but I still always advocate for every one of my patients to undergo fertility preservation before they start any therapy and for, for exactly the reason that you are describing, um, because um, I hate that, you know, I, I dread that situation where someone is primary refractory and needs to rush into second line therapy, which would have a high risk of infertility. Um, and we never had, you know, we don't really have time to, to, um, to do fertility preservation. So, um, and, I, and that's a situation, I, I describe that, pro, you know, that to all my patients. Um, most of my patients will go forward with, um, with, with fertility preservation. I have a few that end up um, 
not going forward with it. And often it's because, you know, unfortunately it's because of cost. Um, you know, usually we're able to, um, usually we have some time to, to do it, you know, or if they're symptomatic, we can even start them on steroids while they're going through it. But um, not all um, insurance covers it. Um, and, um, and so sometimes people are, are not able to go forward with it because of that reason. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So, uh, other question I have, ma'am. So, in your practice, like, what percentage of patients, like, who are PET2 negative and who tend to be positive at the end of therapy? So, how do you prognosticate um, such patients and how do you uh, treat such patients? Um, so, that's a great question. So, I mean, it's, it's a small number. So, patients who are PET2 negative and then are, are PET6 positive, basically, is, is the question. And, of course, it's a small, it's a very small number of patients. Um, but, um, but it's, um, but, you know, it certainly happens. And, and it's, you know, the reason why we have to, I, I always get a PET scan at the end of six cycles. I think some people I've seen in the literature have advocated that, oh, if they're PET2 negative, you don't need another PET scan. But I always get one at the end because, there are, um, we do have um, occasional individuals who are still going to be PET positive. And then I always do a biopsy for those patients. I mean, they have primary refractory, I mean, they're indicating that they have primary refractory disease, but um, we have to confirm that with a biopsy. And then, um, you know, assuming that our, you know, we confirm that, then they would go down um, salvage therapy with auto transplant. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Dr. Ankit, your question, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vaskovic, for that wonderful lecture. Uh, I have two questions. First is for uh, relapsed respiratory uh, disease. Uh, uh, if the patient is not uh, able to uh, get uh, BV or uh, nivolumab, so how do you find uh, bendamustine-based regimen? I know that you have a, a trial published in uh, 2013. So what are you use? Uh, if, uh, the checkpoint inhibitor and uh, target setup is not available whether the bendamustine plus or minus uh, denidomide would be a good op option? Um, yeah, I, I think it's an option. Um, I, um, you, if I couldn't use brentuximab or, or PD-1 blockade, I, I guess I, I'm more, I, I, I feel like we have more long-term experience as with second line use of ice. And so I, I'd probably go back to, you know, kind of the older regimen like that. Um, I, I think, but, um, but it's certainly reasonable to use, um, the bendamustine-based regimen, um, bed, uh, bendamustine with, with gemcitabine, the BEDGEV regimen um, is, is a reasonable regimen as well. Um, you know, they certainly saw a very high, uh, a nice high complete response rate with that. Right. And the uh, second question is, uh, if the patient is uh, PET positive before going for a uh, rogus transplant, you know, with PET free or relapsed rating, uh, would you advise uh, or advocate uh, use of uh, any maintenance therapy at all after uh, autologous if the patient is not able to get uh, target uh, oh if they're not able to get any target yeah. so um if they're pet positive before you know after salvage i really i would give another salvage you know I, and even so and if we didn't have i would go back to kind of the older this older approach you know if we only had the standard drugs or the old traditional drugs available um you know i would i would use what was done in, in the study led by Craig Moskowitz, where they first get ice-based therapy, and if they're pet two, if they're pet positive, then they get gemcitabine-based regimen. Um, you know, I think you know that got a, a fair number of patients to be pet negative before transplant. Um, as far as maintenance after transplant, there's really no data um, for any other drug except for using brentuximab. You know, based upon the Athera study, I, I certainly would use brentuximab, you know, as, as maintenance, um, because this is a high risk patient who needed two rounds of salvage, um, you know, based upon, um, had primary, potentially primary refractory disease, based upon a thera, this would have been considered a higher risk patient um, who would likely benefit from brentuximab maintenance, but um, there's no data really to support any other agent um, as maintenance. And the uh, last question is, uh, the patient is uh, PET positive after uh, salvage therapy, even uh, second salvage regimen, and uh, uh, would you like to straight away go to allogenic transplant and uh, if fellow, whether haplo or uh, mud, if the matched donor is not available, if a matched family donor is not available? So if they're pet positive before trans, so I, I would still do an auto transplant. Honestly, okay. I, I never, okay. I never consider an allo before I've before an auto for Hodgkin okay. lymphoma because I still think that there's a portion of patients who be cured, and I'm worried about the toxicity of allo. Okay. 
right and the uh, second part is uh, if the patient is candidate uh, in your uh, is uh, for a allogeneic transplant and if uh, he does not he or she does not have a, a mesh donor would you go for a mud donor or a haploid donor haploid identity um i mean there seems to be a suggestion that haplo may be a little better but i um i you know i honestly would go with whatever um, our transplant group is most comfortable with oh. and what, what they have the most experience with and, you know, what they recommend as far as our, you know, the best donor. Okay. Dr. Ramesh, be ready with your question. In the meantime, I'll take some of the questions from the audience. Dr. Sailesh Lavana has a case. Uh, he has got a 30 years male Hodgkin's lymphoma, stage four. Persistent disease after ABVD, after ice therapy, patient was also given nivolumab, but the disease is still persistent. How would you consider this patient now, and how do you treat this patient now? Okay, so I'm just reading the chat. So, 30 year old with stage four persistent disease after ABVD and ice, and then nivolumab. So, they never actually had an auto transplant, it sounds like. Yeah. They were just never able to get there. Um, so, what I actually would consider doing. Um, you know, I don't know if Brentuxim, it looks like Brentuximab wasn't, um, I don't know if it's not available. Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, what? Yeah, this is, Brentuximab has not been given. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if, no, if they're, if they're still, if they're tolerating nivolumab, um, I might try adding something to it um, to try to um, improve the efficacy. So, and since they've never had brintuximab, but maybe try nivolumab plus brintuximab, um, or um, I might try to. Uh, another option is to switch to pevolizumab plus gemcitabine or the gemcitabine, venerolabine, and doxel um, to try to get them into remission. And I would still try to aim for an auto transplant. You know, assuming I can get disease control, um, and and often we can by adding something to the checkpoint inhibitor. Um, rather, and, and so that's my preference still, you know, because it's, there's, there was a retrospective analysis showing that even patients with, who've received multiple lines of therapy, um, they still can be cured with an autologous central transplant, particularly if they've received, um, you know, it, it, receiving a checkpoint inhibitor kind of close to the transplant or right before the transplant seems to improve. Um, there's a suggestion that that can improve their outcomes, and maybe because the checkpoint inhibitor is sensitizing them to the chemo in the in the auto transplant. Um, and so, so I, I would still aim to try to get them to auto transplant by kind of adding something to the nivolumab or trying GVD. Thank you so much, ma'am. Dr. Ramesh, your question, please. So good evening, ma'am. So, uh, what is the role of brentuximab in uh, pediatric Hodgkin lymphoma patients upfront? In uh, advanced stage patients, uh, in combination with OEPA copdecmon. So I, you know, I, I don't treat pediatric patients, and I um so I, I feel like I'm not as up on the data. Um, you know, I, I um, you know, I understand. You know, there there was a nice study um where they um showed that the addition of brentuximab um to their um, upfront regimen used for early stage disease, um, you know, improved the outcomes, um, you know, was associated with a marked improvement in progression-free survival, um, a little probably still too early to show an improvement in overall survival. Um, but at least in the early stage setting, it appears that brituximab plays an important role um, and I think it has changed the management um, for early stage pediatric disease. And so my, my assumption is that um, we'll eventually see that in advanced stage disease as well. But um, I... Um, you know, I'm not as up on the on the data, so I, I don't want to um, go out of my uh, lane a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Chiraksha, you had a question. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, so um, you mentioned that uh, Pembro GVD, uh, you would use only two cycles and then check PET, right? <laughs> Okay, so that's good. That makes it cost effective also for us. Uh, and then second question is that we see a lot of patients who cannot get uh, CR. Um, so how many cycles, how many lines of salvage would you keep on trying? Because, you know, if we keep on trying, then one, they run out of money, of course, but additionally, they 
could develop some infection, uh, renal insufficiency, some other issue, and then you completely lose them. So would you rather say transplant anyway after two salvage or some guidance on that piece? Um, well, I, I, I think it depends upon how much disease they have. I mean, if they truly have active disease going into either auto or allo transplant, I, they're just not, I don't think that they're, it's going to be effective. So I think we're doing them a disservice by taking them to transplant. Um, and, you know, and so, I mean, if it's only minimal residual active disease, then I would hope that maybe it's not active and, you know, and not truly disease and maybe they, they can do okay with transplant. Um, another thing, I mean, another tool that we have that, you know, that I use from time to time is someone who has residual active disease maybe in one spot before transplant or in a, in a radiation field, you know, will um, we'll use radiation to kind of treat that residual disease and then take them right to transplant. And um, I, we have, we, we have a few patients over the years where we've done that approach for and actually, um, you know, have thankfully they've, they've, many of them have been able to stay in remission. And it doesn't make any sense, you know, they, you know, they technically had probably had chemo refractory disease um, and we just got them into remission with radiation and then the transplant potentially kept them in, in, in remission. Um, but um, it seems like that approach um, may be okay for some patients. Um, I'm going to have to, I, I'm, I'm going to have to just do one more question because I, I have to um, run to a wedding. <laughs> so um, if, if it's okay, if we could just do one more question. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. Then. Uh, we'll just have a quick one question, one or two last, just last remaining. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Kanan uh, in the chat box. He says, is there any situation where you can avoid transplant in lab setting? Um, well, we're, we're looking, we're, we're doing a study right now to, to determine that and, you know, and others are doing that as well. So um, we actually have two different studies where we're looking at that. Um, one study, we're looking at patients who are what we would think of as the most favorable relapse patients. So they, they always had early stage disease, they relapsed with early stage disease, and they have disease that's, avail, you know, that's encompassed in a radiation field. And we are enrolling them on a study, if they agree, obviously, um, where they receive just four doses of pembrolizumab. And if they have, and then we do a PET scan. And um, even if they have pet positive disease, um, we still um, keep them on study um, as long as they're, um, you know, and that just kind of dictates the dose of the radiation, but then we consolidate with radiation therapy. And it's a very small study and it's ongoing. There's only about 14 patients that we've treated that way. Um, and we haven't reported it because the study's still enrolling. Um, we're aiming to enroll about 22 patients. Um, and uh, the majority of the patients actually have done well. We have had some patients who have relapsed and then we just take them down the standard route um, with auto transplant. And so, that's one group. And then for all the other patients, actually, we're now doing a study with PEMBRO-GVD where we give up to, we give four doses, four cycles of PEMBRO-GVD. And if they're PET negative, instead of doing transplant, we, we do pembrolizumab maintenance for 13 doses of pembrolizumab. Um, and so we're studying that right now. It's also currently enrolling, um, you know, that's, it's a, it's a small study, but um, we have about 19 patients on so far. And so that's something that, um, We'll see. You know, I think the, the question is whether we can, we'll, we'll figure out if we can avoid it for some patients and hopefully for those who can't, who prove that they relapse and hopefully we can just use transplant really in the third line setting for those patients. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, should I go with last question? This is remaining. Should I go with that or you want to go? Your wish. Um, yeah, this I could is, do yeah. one more question. Last, the last question. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a question from uh, Akhil Rajendra, he says, in the Aquilon trial, how did the use of modified PFS as an endpoint impact the outcomes of the patient in the trial? What was the intention of using this endpoint in the study rather than the regular PFS endpoint? Well, that was one of the biggest criticisms of that study was the use of modified PFS. And I think it, it could have impacted that initial, the, you know, their initial results um, because um, you know, the patients were not blinded. Nobody was blinded on the study. So what that, you know, you we might have been more likely to do a second additional therapy if we knew the patients got ABVD, for example, versus brintuximab plus ABD. So that definitely could have impacted um, the outcomes. 
um, the the study, the investigators listened to that complaint and, you know, and subsequently did a formal progression, you know, normal progression free survival. And that's what they've really reported um, going forward. And so that six year progression free survival curve I, I showed was really truly progression free survival and not modified progression free survival. And and honestly, you know, we, we you know, I think no studies will be designed that way in the future because of all the criticism. But, you know, in the end, given that the study has a survival benefit, I think in, now it doesn't really matter because that's kind of um, not as subjective. Last quick question. How do you uh, treat the patient who is present in Hodgkin's lymphoma with a deranged liver enzymes? This question from you, Carla. With elevated liver enzymes? Yes, elevated liver enzymes. Um, so if they, I might treat them initially um, with like single agent cyclophosphamide um, to get the disease you know under control and get their liver enzymes under control and then hopefully that you know can, um, then I can proceed to the standard therapy. Well thank you so much ma'am. That was really a wonderful session. You were so fabulous, excellent in your presentation, crystal clear and what a discussion and what a session you had. Thank you so much for answering all of our questions. You were so patiently answering all the questions. Superb, fantastic, excellent hats off to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So nice to see you all. <laughs> Take care.